Welcome to all of you who have chosen to join Novatore for its second lipstick lunch. Let me shortly introduce Novatore. My co-founder, Dagnia Leinia, and I, by Barubesa, decided to launch an organization dedicated to women's economic empowerment and leadership by connecting, supporting, and driving the like-minded. For more details, I encourage you to investigate our website www.novatore.eu. Now, one of our initiatives is based on advocacy to enlighten ourselves and decision makers on issues that hinder or drive women's economic empowerment. Today's presentation is one close to my, my own experience and my own heart, women and Baltic boards. In fact, my realization that we need to turbocharge the road to boards for many more women is what drove me to found Novatore. But first, technicalities. This session will last no longer than half an hour. Our speaker will present the topic for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then you have the opportunity to comment or question. These comments can be posted either in the Q&A function at the bottom right of the Zoom screen or on our Facebook page connected to this session. Should we run out of time to respond to all questions, we will follow up on as many as possible on Facebook's Novatore.eu site. Later today, a recording of this lipstick lunch will be open to everyone on our Facebook page, Novatore.eu, for you to listen to again or share. In fact, I'm delighted to hear that yesterday's um, lecture by Christine Yarva has already been looked at by over 400 people. Fantastic. And tomorrow you will be able to connect to, connect to us uh, and share these interventions on YouTube. And now, without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, Daiga Auzinha Mel Alksne. She is a financial executive with over 20 years of leadership and management experience as this financial services executive. Currently, the head of NASDAQ's Baltic Exchanges, she also serves as CEO of NASDAQ Riga. She is a BICG, Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance board member, and the chair of the Corporate Governance Board in Latvia. Moreover, she's an unrelenting, steady driver for, at a minimum, gender diversity on boards. Thus, she will speak to the reality of gender balance on Baltic boards. Daiga, the floor is yours. Baiba, thank you for kind introduction. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, my presentation today is about what is reality of gender balance in top Baltic companies. And I will present two sets of data. Uh, none of them are absolutely perfect, but they show the trend and they absolutely also show that the improvement is needed. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, for last 15 years uh, in Latvia, uh, we produce most valuable company top 101. And for last couple of years, also in Estonia. And this is really the top Latvian and Estonian companies uh, those are companies that create most of the jobs, so they are important uh, uh, employer. Uh, those are the companies that pay the most of the taxes and contribute to economic growth of both Latvia and Estonia. And when we al analyze the gender balance, because last year we also updated criteria, and uh, to the corporate governance rating, we added this gender balance. We see that actually, picture is not so bright. Uh, we see that on management board in 42 companies uh, or 42% companies have both genders presented. And in Estonia, it's half, around 20%. So obviously, this is something that needs improvement. But in Baltics, we have two level governance structure. We have a management board, which is like executive level, and we have councils or supervisory boards those are the bodies that set companies' strategy. And when we look at supervisory boards, we see that in Latvia, only 7% have both genders represented 
and Estonia it's around 10 percent and and I think it speaks very loud uh, that there are there are problems and we need to think how we can improve the situation but for this event we also wanted to cover Baltic angle uh, therefore we go to the next slide where we have analyzed the listed companies of course listed companies present smaller uh, size of Baltic economies but we, here we can see the Baltic picture and uh, we see that in in Latvia the, about a quarter of companies have gender balance on boards or at least there are both genders uh, represented. In Estonia, the picture is pretty much similar to top 101, 18% and 9%. And uh, in Lithuania, is is a little bit surprising because there are more women represented on supervisory boards, which is an excellent uh, sort of trend. But of course, 23% representation is not uh, something that should be the end goal. And we see that in management boards, it's around 15%. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, if we look at listed companies, we can say that basically in the top management, men form around 80% of management and supervisory boards. And I think this small picture is sort of uh, speaks the reality more than even figures, yeah? Uh, we see that 33 Baltic companies are governed by men only, and twenty, and we can say that twenty-five companies have a gender-balanced governance structure. Of course, in each market, we have companies that have gender-balanced boards. Here we can name, for example, in Estonia it's Silvano Fashion Group, in Latvia it's Mother, and in Lithuania it is Jemaitius Pienas. So there is, uh, there are good examples to follow. However, the gap is quite large. So next slide. And of course, uh, when we look at, the, at, at this data, uh, it asks why it is so, you know? And of course, I don't have very scientific data on this, but my personal opinion is that in Baltics, sort of uh, the general belief in society is that we are fine with gender balance, and it is not a problem in Baltic companies, because like women have all doors open, they can apply for the positions. We love women. We heard it so many times, but, but, but when we analyze the statistics, we see that actually a picture is not so rosy. And I think it is also important for us women to, to realize that there is a problem and, 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 and think about it more proactively. One of the sort of solutions could be that there are diversity requirements uh, starting, of course, with state-owned enterprises, because they are, uh, in state ownership, there are big companies, and we know that in Baltics, quite large part of economies is actually state-owned. So one of the ways to go forward would be to introduce this gender balance requirements when SOE boards are, are being uh, selected and, and recruited. And uh, currently, we also have soft requirement for listed companies, and, and Perhaps this is also something where we can look into and see, do we need a more, uh, more uh, uh, stri stringent uh, requirements in, in the future? But I think the most important part is sort of to have a discussion about it. Because, uh, you know, this society, society's perception that all is okay and there is no problem, of course, there is a hard to make changes. I also think that one of the reasons why statistics is what it is, is maternity leave policies. Because when a woman has a child, uh, she has to choose whether she is staying at home or going back to work. And when we look at the policy of uh, child support, for example, in Latvia, we see that if, if women woman ch chooses to stay at home, she receives 60% from her gross salary. But if she chooses to go back to work, she receives only 30% of her gross salary, which is very interesting. Why sort of government is making a choice instead of me, what is good for my family? And I think it's quite discriminating. Also, because um, for example, when you are on a maternity leave, of course, there are no contributions made to your pension payments. And even more so, if you 
have several children in, in the row, you are out of uh, job market for several years, five, six, who knows, maybe 10 years. And then actually you have lost your uh, career. You have to start at the bottom, you know? And if the family situation doesn't work out, then actually very often women are put at very high risk of poverty. And of course that is very dangerous. And I think the government policies can play a major role in, uh, in uh, sort of facilitating that women choose career, both career and the family. Because nowadays, I think the beauty of our life today is that actually we don't have to choose between the family and having a career. We can have both. Of course, there's also huge pressure from society that women should stay uh, home with children. And uh, especially I have experienced that when I have spoken with some of my Estonian colleagues in the past, because in Estonia, the child support is uh, more generous, you know, than in Latvia and Lithuania. And then very often, uh, there is simply no choice for women uh, to make. She has to stay home because the, the pressure from society is state pays you such high support. Why are you choosing uh, uh, work over family? Obviously, you are a bad mother. And, and, and I think it is very, very sort of uh, discouraging. And of course, I think what else could encourage women to take more leadership roles and also to have a career is family impact. And we, of course, uh, learn from what role models we have observed in our childhood. And I think here, very important is the role of mom or mother. If uh, our moms were working moms, then of course, there is larger chances that also we will be working women and will have a career, you know. So, I, I, of course, this is more past, but I think uh, those of us who have daughters, we can do a better job and encourage the girls to choose a career and, and sort of uh, to be in charge of their uh, future destiny and, and life. So, thank you. But this is my perception, perception of, about the problem. Of course, and next slide, please. So I would be very happy also to learn and have a discussion. What do you think is a, is a cause of such bad statistics in, in Baltics? Thank you. Thank you very much, Daiga. Please feel two, you know, some 200 uh, uh, hands clapping, uh, you know, and thanks for uh, kicking off this topic. Uh, I will remind everybody listening that you can on Zoom connect to the Q&A button on the bottom right hand side of the screen with your question or comment and the same and in Facebook, uh, those who are connected through the Facebook page, you can uh, pose your questions there. I have a question though. When I take a look at the numbers that you look at, especially about supervisory boards, uh, the first thing that always comes to my mind is the famous Supreme Court Justice, uh, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, when she was asked uh, what would be the perfect balance of women on the Supreme Court of the United States, she said, I wouldn't mind it if it were nine. And you should know that there are nine Supreme Court just justices uh, in the United States. What do you think? is the number we should aspire to or the percentage? Is it really 50-50 or how would you look at, you know, what would you look upon as the number as to have reached a goal of really well-balanced and diverse boards? Yeah, no, I think st statistics is, is statistics and it's uh, often sort of, uh, it's, it's just a number and it's hard to achieve it in real life. But uh, I mean, I, I don't think we should go for for the exact number of 50, yeah. But, but I, I think it's like, no, achieving a half is, is good, you know, that would mean that there really is a difference. Uh, something good has happened. But, but I think it, it is also wrong sort of to think that things will happen just uh, by themselves, yeah. Because it's, it, it is exactly how, how have I also said before that the general perception is that things are fine, that if someone wants, they can apply for the positions and, you know, sort of take position and so on, but somehow it is not happening. 
So obviously we need a more uh, sort of structured approach, a more targeted approach to this problem. Thank you. Anita Bilzan asks, thank you, Daiga, for this overview. But are there transparent rules how boards are chosen, or is it still quite an emotional decision? Yeah, no, of course, there are different companies. Uh, in, in private companies, I think it is more of a, I think there is no structural approach to supervisory board compositions, period. Yeah. It is more like sort of who do you know? We, we have a position, who do you know? Yeah. We don't look at sort of the competencies so much about the, uh, don't think about the future, you know. Of course, there are some exceptions and we are starting to see those exceptions. I think in state-owned enterprises, I, I had the opportunity to participate in one of the nominations committees. And I think it's more about like different criteria, you know, statistical criteria that you need to meet, you know, to be eligible for that position. And if for some reason you don't meet this very specific criteria, you are so, so, simply taken out. So I, I think here we need, uh, this is something that can be done actually, because with, I mean, state-owned enterprise, it's, it's sort of, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is sort of in our, in our hands. So I, I actually think that we can have a good dialogue with the uh, with, with institution who does the selection and, and see how we approach it. But I think also the general awareness that it's a gender balance needed is not there because I remember exactly the discussion in this, uh, nomination committee, we had a two candidates, a woman and, and, a, and a man. And I said, what about gender balance? And one comment that I received was, but we cannot discriminate men. But I said, but it's not about discriminating men, it's about looking who is already on the supervisory board. And there happened to be actually two men. So to me, the choice would be obvious, but it wasn't obvious to the, to the people in the group. I mean, I must say, I have been uh, part of these selections and I've been selected myself, whether supervisory boards or, or management boards. And uh, the way that this is done in a privately owned company or even a listed company versus how it happens on state-owned enterprises in Latvia is vastly different. And uh, uh, one would generally, this the state-owned companies, I would say, uh, have criteria. It's like a procurement process, <laughs> you know. So you're having, exactly. same sort of, you know, procurement that gets the points and all of this, and then we have this way of selecting. There is, I would say, to, to a large extent, less emotion involved. Whereas in a private or a listed company, you are looking more towards either expertise in a certain area on a supervisory board or supervisory board members that can talk to a very specific kind of a community or have knowledge to drive the business forward. Okay, now we have questions coming in fast and furious. So let me try to get through them. Aya Ingrida asks, is there a type of company that tends to have more women on their boards or a specific industry, for example, from social services or elsewhere? Yeah, of course, every company that re or, or institutions that requires hard work, women are there, especially in finance department, but it's because it's very demanding. So CFO often is a, is, is a lady. Uh, okay. Um, question, that's Aquila asks, what about the fact that females are most often acquiring university education than men in Baltic countries? Hence, we could say they are better educated for these management roles. How does the, uh, this factor into the outcome in the data that you showed? Well, it, 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 it shows that women with good education are not choosing management roles, actually. And we had a discussion this morning with one legal uh, bureau. And what uh, the, the, they were saying is actually that more women graduate from law faculty, but very few make partners because someplace down the line, they have to choose family, you know, maternity leaves, children, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously they are not supported to make this next step to partnership. Okay. Vanda Daugsta asks, what role could or should inclusion training 
or I'd say diversity training play in gender balancing? Yeah, I, I really, I'm not sure. I, I think it is very important sort of training, but it has to be <laughs> really conducted well, because I haven't had chance to participate in really good uh, inclusion training, actually. So it is, um, yeah. I will be very partisan in this uh, from Novatore. Please watch this space. We will be offering uh, some analysis, discussions, and training around diversity management in companies about a month from now. So, uh, but it's a very, very good question. Uh, then a question from Laura Marta Zobova. Thank you for the discussion. I would like to raise a question regarding the sexism that exists towards women in business world. What is your opinion about it and what would be your view of how this can be changed? Well, I think you, I mean, uh, if you feel that you are treated that way, then you speak up and say that you're not going to tolerate it. Have you ever experienced it? Well, you know, I sort of don't remember all that I have experienced in life, but, you know, I, I think to me it always works. You can uh, play dummy also, you know, sort of if, if you are given some remark or something, you just pretend you don't understand and move on, you know. So okay. all this helps. Irina Pigwasna has an interesting comment. Thank you, Baiba. Very good insight. Don't you think that it is about men as well as women? Because until you have also gotten the same types of entitlement in terms of pater paternity leave that you get as maternity leave, then you are not giving the same kind of equal opportunities. I personally think the big thing that comes across, it's all about equal choice and opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Equal choice. That, that's what I spoke. I think present uh, policies are actually very gender biased. Okay. Then I have two questions that are similar in a way. So I'll pose them one after the other. Christine Dorosko says, asks, what are the key success factors in achieving the career goals from your personal experience? While Anja Reinfeld has the following question. Thank you for a great presentation. Taking into account that you both have great careers, could you share your own experience and have you felt that women are sometimes treated differently? What advice would you give to young professionals and motivated girls? You go first, Daiga. Yeah, you know, I cannot say that my career was very sort of chosen in a way that I like sort of had a plan and then arrived there. No, I, I think it was more, I always remember my mom saying, uh, just go for it, you know. Never mind, <laughs> never mind. Uh, say it's not going to be freshly cooked dinner or something else. Go for it. I will look after children. It's no problem. So I think this is something that uh, we can learn in our life and support our our children, our girls, you know. But about the career, I think sort of I, I like this uh, quote from Alice in Wonderland, where she has this dialogue with the Cheshire cat, and she asks where sh should she go. And the cat asks, where does she want to be? And she says that she doesn't know. And then the cat says, then it doesn't matter where you go. So my advice would be sort of take a white paper and put on sort of couple things, where you want to be, how you want to feel, and, and forget about that list. And find it after a couple of years, and you will be surprised that actually maybe half of those goals you have achieved. But you have to understand where is that place where you have to want to be. Uh, we have more questions here, especially from Ilza Medna that people are unhappy. I haven't asked you, but we're starting to come to the end of this. In a nutshell, therefore, from your previous advice, would you be kind enough to share practical advice for women who wish to be in charge of their professional de development or better their professional success? Practical advice, go for it. Understand what you want and apply for the positions, improve your LinkedIn profile, work on your CV and just ask, uh, ask for promotion. And if it's not given, look, look where, where you can get it. 
because it's uh, you are in charge of your life uh, so just just do it like nike that's an excellent piece of advice i can only support it and therefore the most important lipstick launch question what is your position on lipstick obviously positive <laughs> but but i have always admired women who have those red lips and they can go throughout the day without the smudge i am not one of them <laughs> it lands on my it, it always lands someplace where it's not supposed to be so uh, but i think we should actually we should wear lipstick we should dress up we should put on nice shoes and we should uh, buy and, and wear nice things because we simply deserve it. That's a very good reason. We've had some people already write to us and ask, why are we actually so sexist in a way of calling this lipstick lunches? I hope that women have a good enough sense of humor and pride in themselves that they can understand that this is about women's issues with something that is simply beautiful, doesn't have to be absolutely killingly red it can be all kinds of colors because we come in all kinds of colors um i would like to thank everybody who has joined us today the need for gender diversity is our name of the game so i would like to invite you to join us tomorrow at 12 o'clock to hear olga zene share insight about the impact of gender diversity on organizational performance and there we'll also be actually able to respond to some of the questions from today that talks about how should uh, one work within an organization regarding mentors, baby rooms, government policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that Olga studies uh, quite a lot and will be able to address in her own right. I should also perhaps give you a bit of a teaser in that uh, a few weeks from now, watch this space, we have been able to uh, uh, to confirm that Professor Linda Scott from Oxford University, who wrote the book, The Double X Economy, will be our guest who probably has had the most cogent um, uh, uh, insight and, and uh, studies on women and the economy. Because to sum up uh, for me what uh, Daiga uh, presented today, why is it important to have more women on supervisory boards, especially and uh, uh, management boards as well? It is because generally uh, companies per, uh, be, uh, perform up to 25% better on their bottom line when the management and supervisory councils are at least in balance. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope to see you tomorrow. And then the next session will be next week. And you will, we will be able to post on our website and Facebook, Novatore EU, who comes next. Thank you very much. <laughs>